You can't deal with your own mind. You can only deal with outer conditions telling you to make mistakes. You stop, your armed forces stop the pirates from coming. We always compare defilements to pirates outside attacking your mind. Armed forces protect you from the pirates. But the policeman, the meditation, protects you at home. And the central government protects you from the seats of these defilements before they are arising. So you see how important this prajna? So what's the meaning of prajna then? So now you know, I should talk a little bit more. And some people will say, um, do you practice this separately? You practice morality first, and then you practice meditation, and then you practice wisdom. Do you take it by stages? You don't take it by stages. You take it all at once, simultaneously. If you just build up the armed forces without a central government and without the policemen, it's not going to be peaceful. All of this should be developed at once. Cultivate that at once. And each deal with different defilements, the very fine, the seeds, the cruder and the crudest defilements. And one should not say, oh, the, uh, so the crude uh, uh, precepts only do deal with crude defilements, so they are not important. The important ones deal with the seeds and the finer ones. That's not, that's not true. Are armed forces important to the country? Can you say, all oh, armed forces are not important, only policemen and central government are important? No. The pirates are coming. They're going to attack your central government. They're going to attack your policemen. So all of these should be developed and cultivated at the same time, simultaneously. You see what I mean? So, what's prajna? We learned about it before. Prajna is a Sanskrit word. Pra means the top, the topmost, the utmost, the unequal. Nothing can be topper than that, higher than that, the highest. So pra, na means understanding. So that's the high, prajna means the highest and the topmost understanding. That's prajna. And this understanding is not just temp ordinary intelligence or, or, or like that. This, this prajna, it's prajna of wisdom. Worldly wisdom, worldly intelligence could, be, could contain good or bad elements in it. The very clever the very intelligent scientists invented the atomic bomb. And some use it for bad purpose, and some use it for good purpose. So, world intelligence could be good and could be bad. Or you can say, world wisdom could be geared towards good side and sometimes geared towards the bad side. But, wisdom is the pure, the perfection, the wisdom that helps you to get out from samsara. It has no good or bad side. It's the pure one. It's out of duality, beyond good and bad. It's beyond that. So, the Buddha preached for 49 years, and the Chinese Buddhist scholars classify his teaching into five periods. Um, I'm telling you these five periods so that you know the importance of prajna. As I said, today is just an introduction. We're going to take it, we're going to, this sutra is a long sutra, we're going to do it a little slowly so that you can absorb more and more. Um, by the time you finish listening to it, you know almost like a major portion of Prashna Paramitta. The Buddha preached for 49 years. Buddhist scholars classified his teaching into five periods, and you have to know these five periods. If you know these five periods, you will know what kind of sutras the Buddha talk about in different periods. And, and there is a gutter, a poem that says like this, and I'm going to translate it into, for you so that you understand the, uh, the different times and the sutras of the Buddha's teaching. In the first period of his teaching, 
The Buddha turned his first Dharma wheel, that is to say, to teach for the first time. His teaching resulted in the compilation of a Vatim Saka Sutra. This is a very profound sutra. Only great Bodhisattvas, Maha Bodhisattvas, understood the profound meaning. So the Buddha only gave a short lecture for 21 days. The first Dharma wheel, uh, according to the Mahayana approach, uh, the first one he turned, Mahayana Buddhism, is the Avantamsaka Sutra, and he lectured for 21 days. The only great Bodhisattvas knew the profundity of the Sutra, so he turned to some easier philosophy, so that most of the audience will understand. So he, he, he talked about Avantamsaka for 21 days only. Huayan Jing. That's a very profound sutra. And that, that's translation for it. There's even English translation for it, I think. You have to look for it on the internet. And then the second period, the Buddha taught the Agamas Sutra. Uh, basically the Hinayana approach and the Theravada approach of Buddhism. This second period, he taught only not for 21 days, he taught for 12 years. Avinan and Avinan and Agama Sutra, A-G-A-M-A-S. Lots of Agama Sutras should look for in the internet. Basically, it's very related to the Theravada school of Buddhism. Um, we have to learn it, the, the Agama Sutras, different Agama Sutras. That's the second period. He turned to the, to the easier philosophy to another group of, to the mass assembly of, of audience. Uh, because what's the point if, if only great Bodhisattvas understand, ordinary people don't understand. So after 21 days, he turned to the easier philosophy. For 12 years, he taught the Agama Sutra, the Theravada approach. Um, but I have to stress that the Theravada approach, the Hinayana approach, it does not mean that the Theravada is easier, is not as profound, then is not as superior, is not that way. The Theravada is enough to get enlightened to Nirvana. It's not, it, it, it's, it's not profoundity in terms of, oh, this is not as good as that one. It's just a simplicity of approach, a different perspective. So the Theravada is as good the Hinayana is as good as the Mahayana. Don't differentiate it. Don't discriminate. Oh, this is the easier one. Some people um, underestimate the simple approach, but they could, they could never understand the more profound approach because, because of, the, of the ego. They always think that I've got to learn the higher approach. Oh, this is too simple for me. It's just like Anapanasati. And Satipatthana. Anapanasati is enough to take you to the four dhyana level, to the, to the Rupadhatu, four dhyana level. And the Buddha attained Nirvana at the four dhyana level. It's enough to get Nirvana. Anapanasati. Very simple, but that's enough to take you to get enlightened, the Satipatthana. Every, everyone has different causality in learning. Um, one approach, different approaches, the, diff the many, many approaches, this approach to be easier for me, and this approach, I have um, special linkage with this because I learned it in my previous life, and immediately I can link to it. It's not because of this is simple, this is profound, this is not as good, this is superior, this is not as superior. Don't discriminate that. Never discriminate that. So, how about the third period after the Agamas Sutras? The third period, the Buddha taught by Poya Sutrani. The profundity of which is in between Hinayana and Mahayana. Here, also, no difference, it's just a different approach, the Vipuya Sutrani. That's the third period. 
And he taught it for eight years. For eight years. So for another eight years. And how about the fourth period? The fourth period is the teaching of prajna. And the fourth period, after the Agamas, after Avantamsaka, after the Vipula uh, Sutrani, the Buddha started with prajna, paramitta, prajna. And the Buddha taught for 22 years on this subject. That's the longest. So you can appreciate the importance of prajna. Nobody would understand uh, basic Buddhism without understanding prajna. And of course, there's also prajna in Agamas and Avantamsaka. It's just the, the emphasis. It does not mean in the first period, Buddha never talked about prajna, or in the second period, he never talked about prajna. It's just the emphasis. The emphasis on 22 years is on prajna. That's the, the fourth period for 22 years. And how about the fifth period? The Buddha taught five periods. The fifth period is the teaching of Sadama Pundarika Sutra. The Sadama Pundarika, some, some translators, some experts translate it as the lotus of the wonderful law. The lotus of the wonderful, or the lotus sutra. There's English translation for it, the lotus sutra. I think English translation by um, our university, UBC, uh, 30 years ago, there was, a, there, there was a famous professor who specialized in Lotus Sutra, and his name is Hervis, yes. UBC used to have well, one of the strongest Buddhist faculty in North America, and Hervis, uh, unfortunately, I didn't uh, meet him, and he passed away about 15 years ago, maybe 10 years ago. And um, he translated the Lotus Sutra from, I think, from Sanskrit, either from Sanskrit or from Chinese. He's a Sanskrit expert, Hervis. Um, so the fifth period is the teaching of Sadama Pandarika, the Lotus of the Wonderful Law Sutras. There's one translated by Suthil, a British scholar, Suthil. Uh, and also, the fifth period also has the Nirvana Sutra. The Nirvana Sutra and the uh, Saddam Pantarika. All these have English translations. And this period, the Buddha taught for eight years. For eight years. So if you add all this together, the first period, the period of Avantamsaka, Sutrani, for 21 days, only days. The second period, the Agamas, for 12 years. The third period, uh, the Vaipulya, for eight years. The fourth period, Prashna, for 22 years, and the fifth period, the period of Sadhana Pandarika and Nirvana Sutrani, for eight years. If you add this number of years together, it's 49 to 50. So approximately about 49 to 50 years. And now we are studying the Diamond Sutra, which is supposed to be a summary of all the Prashna literature. 22 years, all the Prashna literature. This is supposed to be a summary. So you could assess the importance of this sutra. It's very important. My first reason for saying the Diamond Sutra is important is the period the Buddha covered the longest and the importance of prajna uh, is even leading uh, sila and uh, meditation.